Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, I uh, uh, have the pleasure today of introducing uh, to you uh, Dr. Mark Banaka. Uh, Dr. Banaka is a professor of medicine and the William Hyatt Endowed Chair in Cardiovascular Research in the Division of Cardiology. Uh, Dr. Banaka also serves as the Executive Director of the Colorado Prevention Center. Dr. Banaka received his undergraduate degree from Bucknell University and his uh, medical degree from the University of Connecticut. He also received a, a master's in public health from the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, Dr. Banaka um, uh, completed his house staff training and fellowship training at the Brigham and Women's Hospital where he focused on cardiovascular disease. He established his career at Harvard, and in 2018, we were fortunate to recruit him here to the University of Colorado uh, to lead the Colorado Prevention Center. Dr. Banaka's uh, academic career uh, has focused on uh, multi-centered, randomized, investigator-initiated uh, clinical trials that have focused on very important questions in cardiovascular medicine. These questions um, uh, ranged from uh, critical limb ischemia in understanding critical limb, limb ischemia in uh, diabetics uh, to patients at high risk for atherosclerotic heart disease to ST segment elevation uh, myocardial infarction interventions in ST segment uh, elevation myocardial infarction and uh, to the uh, topic that he's going to uh, discuss today, uh, which is uh, symptomatic peripheral ar arterial disease. So we look very much forward uh, to Dr. Banaka's uh, comments on this uh, problem. And I would encourage all of you to um, uh, submit your questions uh, to the Q&A box uh, so that uh, I can lead a discussion, uh, moderate a discussion at the end of uh, this session. Dr. Banaka. Well, thank you, Dr. Schwartz. It's an honor to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I was very fortunate to come here in, in 2018 and have a, an opportunity to join this uh, wonderful um, university. And uh, some of some people I've interacted with, I think, in the setting of COVID, obviously fewer than, than I would hope, but um, it's an opportunity uh, to share a little bit of, of um, what I've been working on. And, and, uh, and this is really a story of a trial called Voyager, but it's really the story of collaboration and, and the evolution of the disease state along the way. And then most of all, it's a story about mentorship. And, and really, I want to emphasize for all the trainees listening that um, you know, mentorship is crucial. And uh, I've been very fortunate. And if there's anything I can do to support you in all of your careers, please, uh, please reach out. So um, these are my disclosures. And I want to begin with a little bit of history. So when we talk about peripheral artery disease, uh, it's not a new concept, but um, literally putting the, uh, the horse before the human, um, it was actually described in a lame horse by a French veterinarian and who, after investigation, found fibrous clot in the femoral arteries of the posterior limbs and it coined the term around claudication, inter intermittent claudication. Uh, that's a term that derives from the Latin word claudicare, which is to limp, um, and is the typical manifestation of peripheral artery disease in the, in the chronic setting, which is calf pain when you walk that goes away with rest. It was also noted uh, in the mid-1840s, but it was really Charcot in 1858 who defined the syndrome of intermittent claudication and, and put peripheral artery disease on the map although often less recognized in other manifestations of atherosclerosis. Well, a lot has happened since 1858, not all of it good, um, in the sense that the prevalence of peripheral artery disease is increasing dramatically. It's estimated that there are well over 200 million people in the world that have peripheral artery disease, probably around 12 million in the United States, with one to two million of those having the most severe manifestation called critical limb ischemia, and the rate of change is rising quickly. And why is that? Well, because probably the most potent risk factors for development of peripheral artery disease are things like age, obesity, and diabetes. And even though rates of smoking have declined because diabetes is such a potent risk factor for peripheral artery disease, uh, the prevalence is increasing. Now, it may be that 
folks are more aware of PAD, that there's more testing, and you might imagine that that might identify sort of a broader population, a healthier population. Actually, what we're seeing in peripheral artery diseases is the opposite, and that's quite troubling. So in contrast to rates of myocardial infarction and rates of stroke that are decreasing in the setting of smoking cessation, better prevention, we're seeing that patients that have peripheral artery disease are presenting at later stages of disease and with more severe disease. And you can see uh, in these data published in 2016 on the left side of the slide that rates of admissions with critical limb ischemia are uh, increasing and PAD admissions to the hospital so severe manifestations are dramatically increasing. These trends are continuing. Why is that? Well, the epidemiology of PAD is shifting. Uh, we are seeing that the disease that was prevalent in the setting of smoking, which is more traditional athero and the, the more proximal vessels is, is going down, but PAD related to diabetes, so, so distal disease, below the knee, small vessel disease is increasing and is increasingly more difficult to treat. It's long been recognized that by nature of systemic atherosclerosis, patients with peripheral artery disease are at high risk of major adverse cardiovascular events, and particularly in mortality. And here's a seminal publication by Jerry Fowkes and others in the ABI collaboration, which shows the relationship between the ankle brachial index, which is a marker of perfusion or measure of perfusion in the limbs, and mortality. And you can see here on the y-axis, this is the hazard ratio for mortality. And on the x-axis, you can see the ankle brachial index. And you can see that there's a very steep relationship as the ABI goes lower, you have much higher rates of mortality with the hazard ratio about fourfold for people with an ABI less than 7.7. 7. And then you'll see at the right side of the slide that those with the high ABI are, it's a bit counterintuitive, but are also at high risk because they have calcification of their vessels and often severe disease. So this recognition of the disease profile really played a role in terms of how PAD was studied for um, trials of medical therapy for prevention. And, and really, if you look over the 1990s to early 2000s, peripheral artery disease was considered an enrichment factor for risk in large atherosclerosis programs. And that's because by nature of their disease, some call it metastatic atherosclerosis, you know they're high risk, they contribute a lot of events. And all of the chapters and reviews on medical therapy derived from the studies at the top part of the slide. We saw that in the uh, anti-trial, antithrombotic trials collaborative at the far left, aspirin reduced risk overall and with consistent effect in PAD, uh, increased major bleeding. No benefit for limb outcomes, not even actually described in those analyses, but just for MACE. So when I say MACE, I'm talking about major adverse cardiovascular events like heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular death. The Capri trial looked at clopidogrel, a P2Y12 inhibitor, another antiplatelet versus aspirin, showed that it was a little bit better overall, maybe more so in patients with PAD. No benefit, in fact, numerically more amputations for clopidogrel than aspirin. So no benefit for limb outcomes, but a reduction in MACE, consistent benefit in PAD. The HOPE trial, a similar story for ACE inhibitors. Uh, the WAVE trial looked at the, the addition of warfarin, something that was efficacious in patients with myocardial infarction. Uh, in fact, give, given to uh, folks on this campus or at the Eisenhower when he had his MI, um, but not efficacious in PAD. Uh, Life-threatened bleeding increased threefold, no benefit for limb outcomes. The heart protection study or HPS showed that statins were beneficial in a broad atherosclerosis population, consistent benefit for PAD. And then charisma showed that was not beneficial. So these were all subgroups of trials with uh, patients with atherosclerosis, mostly coronary disease, showing consistent benefits in PAD. Now, in contrast, if you look at the middle part of this slide, there were a few trials actually looking at dedicated PAD populations and therapies to reduce major adverse limb events, or what we call MAIL. There was the Dutch BOA trial, which showed that warfarin was not efficacious for uh, bypass occlusions, but increased the risk of hemorrhagic stroke. CASPER looked at DAPT with aspirin and clopidogrel versus aspirin alone after bypass, and there was no benefit for MACE or limb events. And CAMPER was a trial uh, that looked at the same combination after endovascular revascularization, but, but never completed. And there was one therapy, uh, solostazole, approved for functional benefit, although no hard on outcome benefit, and, and was approved uh, in PAD. So this was really the, the state of affairs. And just to highlight, 
a couple of key data points. I mentioned the, the CASPER trial. Here's the, the uh, Kappa-Meyer curves or the cumulative incidence curves on the left. And what you can see is that this is a really sick population for the composite here. Almost half of patients had an event over about a year and a half. But there was no benefit of clopidogrel and there were numerically, uh, there was more bleeding uh, and numerically more cardiovascular death. And then warfarin, again, if you look at bypass occlusions here, just looking at the aspirin arm, you can see you know, 30 to 40% had a bypass occlusion, which is a bad event in this uh, population. Um, and there was more, about a three and a half fold excess in hemorrhagic stroke. So neither of these were um, approved. So this was the state of medical therapy in, in PAD when I was uh, training. Um, and I just wanna you know, pivot a moment to talk a little bit about where I was uh, in, in my training uh, at, at this time. And you can see several pictures on this um, slide. On the left, you can see uh, Dr. Eugene Brumwald, Dr. David Morrow, Dr. Mark Sabatine. These were uh, the leaders and mentors at the Timmy study group. I, I was a, an intern in the CCU and Dave Morrow was my attending. And we were sort of puzzling over whether someone had acute coronary syndrome and talking about how novel biomarkers would be useful. And he said, why don't you come over to Timmy? I've got a data set, we can look at this. Now, we start, I started to work with Timmy and on the right side of the slide in the clinical domain, I started to gravitate to vascular medicine. And you can see Joshua Beckman and Mark Krieger at the far right, uh, leaders in vascular medicine that were my clinical mentors. And what was very fortunate for me um, was that you know, these two things aligned and that I was getting clinical trial training in cardiovascular disease with the folks in the left, a passion for vascular medicine on the right. And both groups agreed that having some hybrid training, allowing me to do both at the same time would be useful. And so this was presented an opportunity for me. Around that time, Mark Krieger, who you saw in the previous slide, published this seminal publication in the New England Journal of Medicine describing something called acute limb ischemia. And, and I have to say, as a cardiology fellow, I never saw acute limb ischemia, but I did see it as a vascular medicine fellow. And, and it's, a, it's a really bad problem. It's a catastrophic condition where patients have the acute loss of blood flow to the limb with high rates of death and amputation. And even patients who are reperfused get a sort of sirs like reaction, have long ICU stays and bad outcomes. And so Mark Krieger had, had described this here in 2012 around the same time as a clinical entity. And I actually got to see it myself, which was quite frightening. Now, back in the clinical trial world, I had the opportunity to work on a randomized trial of a novel therapeutic agent. And, and this drug was called Vorapaxar. It was a PAR1 antagonist. It's actually a derivative of the bark of the Australian magnolia. And it was initially studied for some of these anti-muscarinic properties, actually for dementia. And, and this occurred until PAR1 was recognized by Sean Coughlin and others um, that to be the cellular receptor for thrombin. And that thrombin has actually broad effects in the vasculature, not just uh, uh, in the coagulation cascade, but it's one of the most potent activators of platelets and also has direct vascular effects in terms of inflammation and mitogenic properties. And so this agent was developed for actually restenosis initially in the coronaries, but then as an antithrombotic. And you can see in animal models on the right that when you injure a rat artery in the setting of sham or a vehicle, you get this sort of uh, predictable response, um, which leads to vascular occlusion, whereas in the setting of a part one antagonist that's blunted. So this led to a large randomized trial of 26,000 patients called TRHEP-50. I was the fellow on the trial, um, and Dave Morrow was the principal investigator, uh, also chaired by Dr. Brunwald. And you can see that the results were published here in 2012. And lo and behold, on top of aspirin and clopidogrel, Boric packs are reduced the risk of MACE in patients with atherosclerosis. Now, this is a huge population, um, and you can see that, um, that overall there was benefit, about 13% reduction. Now, because I was passionate about peripheral artery disease and I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Krieger, I uh, led an analysis in the subgroup of patients with peripheral artery disease, about 3,700 patients. And, and here it was interesting. If you look on the left side of the slide, you can see those patients with PAD were very high risk, higher risk than the overall population, but the benefit for MACE was a bit uncertain. The hazard ratio is 0.94. There was no heterogeneity, 
Um, and, um, but, but it looked less robust than the overall trial. Now, on the flip side, we had actually built in the adjudication and collection of acute limb ischemia as part of the trial based on some of the observations in the clinic. And this was very frequent and highly modified in PAD. And when these data were presented, I, I had an opportunity to present them with the late Alan Hirsch uh, and with Elliot Antman at, at the American Heart Association. And the question was, how could this be so frequent? We never see this in the clinic. I, I am a cardiologist. I never see this. And how could it be this modifiable? Perhaps the effect estimate for benefit is an overestimate. You know, it's really 42% reduction here. And so I'll, I'll get to that. But this really opened uh, eyes in terms of what matters in peripheral artery disease and whether the benefit for MACE is the same as those with other patients with cardiovascular disease. Now, Alan Hirsch, who was at that presentation that published these data with uh, Sue Duvall here, and said, well, acute limb ischemia in real world populations is largely embolism. These are probably patients with AFib. Um, you can see in the blue that are having clots thrown to the leg, and, and actually it's less uh, related to intervention. But of course, this was real world data including patients without peripheral artery disease. And we looked at this within the trial, we found actually it was quite different. If you take PAD patients who don't have AFib, actually it's very different. The majority of ALI is caused by surgical graft thrombosis or native vessel thrombosis followed by stent thrombosis. And actually thromboembolism is very rare um, as, as a cause, at least cardioembolism. And as you can see on the right side of the slide, the other question was, is this really a bad outcome? Is it as bad as an MI or stroke? And what we found were that patients who had an ALI event were in the hospital for a median of eight days with a, a range of five to 15 days. And then about one in five had an acute amputation. Uh, about a third were in the ICU for a prolonged period and almost three quarters required a major surgery. About 15% had died or were unable to go home after an ALI event. So outcomes were similar to those for stroke uh, and much worse than those for myocardial infarction. We also asked the question of, are all forms of acute limb ischemia modifiable? We looked at those different buckets of etiology. So graft thrombosis, in situ thrombosis, stem thrombosis, and found consistency across all of these uh, uh, types of acute limb ischemia. So putting that in perspective, although the trial had been de uh, designed around MACE, it really um, showed us a couple things. First of all, that MACE is, risk is high in patients with PAD, but the natural history and really the morbidity is limb related. And that if you wanna know what's gonna happen to a PAD patient in your clinic, about one in four are gonna need an intervention over the next two, three or four years to restore perfusion, either for severe symptoms or to prevent tissue loss. And that the risk of amputation or acute limb ischemia is higher, higher than MI or stroke. So this is a bad outcome. And as I said, acute limb ischemia to me really is the ST elevation MI equivalent of the limb. It's time is muscle. It's the acute thrombotic occlusion of a conduit artery and the downstream tissue is at risk. In the myocardium, you have a myocardial infarction. In fact, you have a reperfusion injury um, in the limb, you see the same thing. You can have a severe ischemia and require fasciotomies and reperfusion injury for people with delayed reperfusion and outcomes after ALI are as bad or worse than for STEMI. So the first lesson in this path was that actually in patients with PAD, maybe MACE isn't the only thing we should be looking at. Acute limb ischemia is frequent, morbid, and modifiable. Now, around that time, Mark Krieger, who was my mentor at the Brigham and, and trained me in vascular medicine, had a friend named Will Hyatt. And I knew of Will Hyatt's name from chapters and reviews that I had read. He was a giant in the field. I'd never met him, but they were close friends. In fact, they had trained together uh, under a gentleman named Jay Kaufman at Boston City Hospital, who was really one of the um, uh, leaders in vascular medicine and really brought the field to the forefront. And they were close friends and Mark Krieger and Will Hyatt started talking about this acute limb ischemia thing. Well, it turned out Will was leading a trial, a uh, trial I wasn't involved in, a trial called Euclid. And it was leading it um, between CPC here at University of Colorado and, and the uh, DCRI. And this was looking at the comparison of a, a newer P2Y12 inhibitor called Ticagrelor versus clopidogrel. And that comparison had been done in patients with coronary disease, acute coronary syndrome in a trial called PLATO. It had been reported in 2009, and lo and behold, 
Ticagrelor wasn't just better than clopidogrel, but reduced mortality because it was so much better than clopidogrel in the acute coronary syndrome patients. So it seemed like a no brainer that if you applied that into a dedicated PAD population, that Ticagrelor would be the winner. And sometimes things that surprise us, even neutral studies are where we learn the most. And Euclid was no, um, uh, uh, no departure from that. Here's the results of the Euclid trial. Very high risk, 12.5% event rate at three years. These were patients selected on the basis of PAD, the largest PAD trial uh, done. And lo and behold, the, the comparison that had showed a mortality benefit in coronary patients showed zero benefit in patients with PAD. This was shocking. And it, you know, a lot of people were scratching their heads. How could this be that in PAD outcomes are so different? The other thing that was striking was that only 30% of these patients had coronary disease. And the classic teaching of it had been, if you have PAD, you have CAD. And so therefore um, you're gonna respond the same way to drugs. And lo and behold, that's not true. Actually only about a third of patients selected on the basis of lower extremity disease have any form of symptomatic or diagnosed coronary disease. And, and actually what was quite interesting, hypothesis generating, but interesting was that there was a statistical interaction for benefit in those patients from Euclid who had coronary disease, meaning it had cabbage or PCI, and there was about an 18% reduction, which looked just like Plato. So could there be heterogeneity in the population? What's well, interesting, if you look back to the CASPER trial, uh, like Euclid, only about a third of the patients had coronary disease. And when you look at Euclid, it was a big trial, there were over 1,200 deaths, and actually the majority of them are not related to atherothrombosis. Actually only 8% of the deaths in Euclid were related to MI or stroke and the majority were non-cardiovascular unknown or other things like heart failure. And so the notion that, that these patients look like coronary patients is actually quite different. And if you contrast this with an acute coronary syndrome population, you see the exact opposite. The majority of deaths are atherothrombosis. The other observation from Euclid, which was important, was that not all PAD patients are the same. Some of these patients have concomitant coronary disease, that 30% so-called polyvascular disease. And when you look at those patients in the red bars versus those with just PAD or just CAD in the yellow bars, those patients with polyvascular disease are at a significantly higher risk of CV death and or stroke. So there is heterogeneity in the population for MACE risk in the response to therapy. But that's not all of it. Part of it was maybe patients who um, have PAD are at differential risk of acute limb ischemia. Maybe there's heterogeneity there as well. And lo and behold, we had done some analyses from uh, TRHUP and from Pegasus and Euclid showed the same thing, that if you were a PAD patient with any history of a limb revascularization, you are at about fourfold the risk of acute limb ischemia long-term than a patient with PAD who'd never had a revascularization. So two observations, one that, that there may be heterogeneity in MACE risk, and then there may be heterogeneity in the risk of limb outcomes. Finally, another lesson from Euclid was that um, not, amputation is a, is a messy endpoint. You know, amputations are easy to measure because you know when they happen, but it's not a biological event. It's something we do to people uh, in response to something, and that, and that something may be heterogeneous. And what we learned from Euclid, if you look at the right side of the slide, and this is from uh, one of our fellows here at CPC, Nick. Um, you can see that in patients with PAD and diabetes, the majority of amputations are driven either by infection alone or infection along with ischemia, not just ischemia. It's not just a blood flow problem. Whereas in patients with PAD without diabetes, it's largely ischemia. So there's actually heterogeneity in what drives these limb outcomes biologically on the basis of concomitant diabetes. Well, Mark Krieger and Will Hyatt were fast friends and they were talking about these data. We took it back to TRA2P and we said, well, if, if there's effect modification for MACE and, and the risk and the effect of therapy and for limb outcomes, let's explore what that looks like in TRA2P. And lo and behold, it holds up quite well. You see on the left side of the slide, just like Euclid, the patients who had both PAD and coronary disease had a big benefit for MACE, whereas those with PAD alone had a hazard ratio of 1.0 and there was statistical heterogeneity. On the right side of the slide, just as had been seen in the other data sets, those patients with PAD who had prior revascularization, what's labeled PAD alone, had a big risk of acute limb ischemia and a big benefit. And those 
who had no prior revascularization had a more modest one. So there are two key lessons here. Not all PAD patients are the same. And the response to MACE for antithrombotic therapy is greater in patients with concomitant coronary disease. And that in those patients without coronary disease, the benefit is for limb outcomes and is prominently in those who've had a revascularization. Now, around the same time as these observations at Timmy, there was another trial ongoing, and this was called the ATLAS trial. This was led by Jess Nega and uh, Mike Gibson, along with Dr. Brumwald. And th this was a very different trial. Here, instead of a PAR1 antagonist, the trial was looking at a low dose of a factor 10A inhibitor, an anticoagulant, on top of aspirin and or clopidogrel in ACS patients to see if they could reduce MACE. And actually, rivaroxaban, the agent studied here, on top of dual antiplatelet therapy, reduced MACE, cardiovascular deaths, and all-cause all mortality. And so this was a striking finding, really a game changer, and it reduced things like stent thrombosis, even on top of DAPT. Well, <clears throat> because we had the data set, we did some exploration there looking at acute limb ischemia. And now this wasn't a PAD population, so event rates were low, small numbers of events, but you can see here that for rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams, and for five milligrams versus placebo, there was a rough halving of the rate of acute limb ischemia. Again, very small numbers and hypothesis generating, but in the context of TRA, very interesting. So then comes Will Hyatt, who was a pioneer in the field. And he put all these observations together and he assembled a group of us to say, can we do a different kind of trial in peripheral artery disease? And one thing that he recognized, and, and these data on the left were published by Connie Hess here at University of Colorado with Will, were that all the trials we've been talking about are chronic peripheral artery disease, but there's a population of patients with PAD undergoing revascularization, the acute coronary syndrome equivalent in peripheral artery disease, and they are at extreme risk. So not only are they at long-term high risk with acute limb ischemia, but if you look at the curve, the red curve on the left, within the first year or two after revascularization, there's an extreme risk profile, these very highly, highly morbid limb events and that there's an unmet need there. And this is where CASPER as a trial had failed. And this is where Dutch BOA had failed. So the question was, could we translate these lessons into a novel trial in PAD? Yes, for polyvascular disease, the risk is MACE, but for PAD, only about 30% of those patients have polyvascular disease. And really the dominant risk in PAD is limb outcomes. And who are the highest uh, risk patients with PAD, those who had recent revascularization, and acute limb ischemia is modifiable. So perhaps this should be part of the primary endpoint. So this was the genesis of the design of the Voyager PAD trial. And this was a trial um, that was pragmatic and, and ambitious. It was uh, a, a large group of PAD patients undergoing revascularization, no enrichment criteria, broadly inclusive. It allowed standard of care in the background, so aspirin and or clopidogrel. And it randomized patients to that combination of rivaroxaban plus aspirin versus just aspirin alone that was shown to be efficacious in Atlas. Now, one thing to notice towards the bottom of the slide, you'll see that the primary efficacy endpoint is different. It's not MACE, it's not male, but it really is a five point composite of irreversible harm events that was specifically designed for this population in this setting. And the first time that this outcome has been studied in a randomized trial, I went with Will to the FDA when we designed the trial to argue that these limb outcomes are just as bad as MI or stroke and ultimately something that they, they accepted when we launched the trial. So Will, uh, Will, Will um, you know, assembled a group of people my, and, and he also assembled a, a very collaborative multidisciplinary group with uh, representation from a number of different organizations. But like all trials, there were curveballs along the way. And, and so one curveball that had happened during the Voyager trial was the COMPASS trial. So COMPASS was the equivalent of TRATP, just excluding stroke patients. And, and those are patients that don't do well with long-term uh, intense anticoagulation. And COMPASS was uh, launched around the time of Voyager, but was expected to go on much longer. Voyager was supposed to finish first. Well, in the middle of Voyager, the COMPASS trial reported, and lo and behold, that benefit uh, seen in the ATLAS trial was also here in stable patients of atherosclerosis. And there was such a compelling reduction in mortality that the DMC had ended the trial early for overwhelming benefit. Even though there was more major bleeding, you can see the effect here, 
there was such a, a, a compelling benefit, um, the trial was unblinded. And we were faced as a steering committee with the question, is it ethical to continue these patients on, uh, on placebo in a randomized trial when the COMPASS trial showed such benefit? But it was interesting that 90% of this population had coronary disease. And in fact, when you looked at the benefit from COMPASS, the benefit was greatest in those polyvascular disease heart failure, diabetes, those, those high-risk groups. But if you look at those without polyvascular disease on the right side of the slide, the benefit was more modest. In addition, in patients with chronic PAD, there was consistent benefit for MACE. You, know, you can see the benefits here for MI, stroke, and CV death, as well as limb outcomes. But these event rates are quite low because this is a population largely uh, recruited on the basis of stable polyvascular disease. There was some reassurance. One was that, and you look at the COMPASS trial, that the risk of those adverse limb events followed exactly the pattern that we anticipated on the prior study. So those patients in the red bar with the prior revascularization for PAD were at very high risk of major adverse limb events, whereas those with claudication or just a low ABI were at relatively low risk. And that supported the notion behind the design of the Voyage trial. And so you can see here, as we weighed the risk benefit of continuing, we talked to the regulators and ethics boards, we recognized that there were a series of new studies that had shown benefit for patients with peripheral artery disease. You can see TRHEP on the far left, Euclid was neutral. The 40A trial uh, showed the benefits for PCSK9 inhibition, both through LDL and, and perhaps through LP Lule, a big benefit for limb outcomes as well, and then COMPASS. And so this, the, the background was changing. We were seeing limb outcome benefit in a series of trials, but these were all largely subgroups and they were stable or chronic populations rather than acute populations. And very few had high-risk groups like critical limb ischemia. And so the trial continued to completion. Ultimately, um, we presented these data uh, earlier in 2020. You can see this was the population that was recruited. And I'll just highlight for you by design, this looks different than those atherosclerosis or coronary trials. You can see here that only about a third of patients had coronary artery, artery disease. This was not designed into the trial. It was, we were just recruited PAD patients, but just like Casper, just like Euclid, only about a third had coronary disease and only about 10% had ever had a prior MI. And if you pause for a moment, when you think about a group of patients in their 60s or 70s, large group with diabetes, concurrent smoking, the fact that so few had manifested coronary disease really speaks to the fact that PAD is a distinct disease state. You can see overall the population was generally well treated and they were really characterized by severe limb disease. So they had um, uh, almost all had a history of claudication. The ABIs were quite low, 0.56. Um, about a quarter of them came in with critical limb ischemia. Uh, and you can see that they um, uh, you know, had um, a, a reasonable history of amputation as well. So a sick PAD population. Well, primary, the results of the trial are shown here. And as uh, it, putting together all these pieces over time for this primary endpoint composite, the combination of rivaroxaban and plus aspirin was efficacious. There was a a uh, significant reduction at three years, 15% relative risk reduction or an absolute risk reduction of 2.6% or number needed to treat of 39. And that this benefit was seen early, as early as uh, three months and, and certainly at six months uh, and continued over time. What was different about the results of this trial relative to the others is what the endpoints look like. And so you can see here broken down below the primary efficacy outcome of the components. So if you look at the red group, th those are the patients on aspirin and clopidogrel, sort of standard of care. The most frequent adverse outcome was acute limb ischemia. So we're winding back to the TRHUP days when Alan Hirsch said, could this really be so frequent? Well, the truth is yes, it's been validated now in several trials. And the other observation was that the hazard ratio was robustly reduced. So these are highly modifiable events. In contrast, you see that events like MI and stroke are less frequent, and even CV death, which is largely non-atherothrombotic, um, although frequent, appears less modified. So the, the benefit was driven as anticipated by thrombotic limb events. And you can see that, I think, quite clearly here in this Kaplan-Meier curve through six months where the benefit for acute limb ischemia was apparent within days uh, and continued over time. 
Now, as seen with other trials with antithrombotic therapy, there's more bleeding. And you can see the bleeding uh, outcomes here. The principal safety outcome was at the far left. That was Timmy major bleeding because of the procedural context. And there was about a 40% increase in bleeding or a number needed to harm of 125. No pattern of excess for intracranial hemorrhage or fatal bleeding. And then you can see as you get to more sensitive bleeding measures, the rates go up on the right, but that the hazard, the relative increase is about the same, about a 40% excess, including for ISTH major. There were a number of subgroups. These are sort of eye charts here, but the, the way to look at subgroup plots are to look for consistency and for efficacy on the left and safety on the right. There was general consistency amongst major subgroups, including the elderly, um, across, um, by uh, diabetes, coronary disease, critical and ischemia, and, and regardless of how folks had their intervention. Now, along with the primary outcome that was novel, there were a series of secondary outcomes that were designed for this population. You can see them listed from left to right. This is the hierarchy of testing. And the way that the testing works is for every endpoint, you have a significant p-value. Uh, you consider it significant, you move to the next until you have one that's not significant and the rest is considered exploratory. I'll, I'll point out just two endpoints here. The second group of bars, unplanned limb revascularization for ischemia. So this is very common. We can see almost a quarter of patients needed a repeat revascularization during the study. And this was reduced with an absolute risk reduction of about two and a half percent. And then the fourth set of bars are really event-free survival because it includes all-cause mortality. And this was significantly reduced with an absolute risk reduction of about 2.6%. You can see no, no efficacy or no effect for all-cause mortality, which is largely non-cardiovascular. This is a very sick population. Um, and there was a nominal uh, benefit for VTE, although it was considered exploratory because of its position in the hierarchy. So overall, Voyager showed uh, net benefit. Um, you can see on the left side for um, uh, about a six to one benefit risk ratio for this broad population of PAD. And then you can see the pattern of risk benefit over time. And so you can see the bleeding risk apparent early as we've seen in other trials of so the bleeding stress test uh, relatively flat over time and that the benefit continues to accrue. Now, there are a couple of key uh, subgroups that I'll just comment on. The first was clopidogrel because everyone wondered you know, what, whether background clopidogrel would modify the effect. Compass didn't study clopidogrel. Um, the data from TRATP with Laura Paxa argued that there would be no effect modification because that it was allowed in that trial. And we saw consistency here, meaning there was no effect modification for clopidogrel, whether you use it on the left or you don't on the right. The benefit of rivaroxaban and, and the safety outcomes were consistent both in relative terms, but also in absolute terms. So you can see the absolute risk reduction in both groups was, was similar, um, somewhere in the order of two and a half percent. The only thing that we saw with prolonged triple therapy was that there appeared to be more bleeding, sorry about that, more bleeding risk in patients who were on long term clopidogrel along with aspirin and rivaroxaban, but if they're short courses of clopidogrel, there didn't appear to be a bleeding price to pay. And so this was one uh, key observation that Will Hyatt published, and there was a, a borderline interaction there. You know, bringing us back to the Euclid trial and some of the observations, even with TRA, about the uh, effect modification for concomitant coronary disease, you can see data here. And it just as anticipated on the left side of the slide, when you look at the outcome of myocardial infarction on the basis of concomitant coronary disease, those patients at the far left with concomitant coronary disease have a high risk of MI and a benefit that was entirely consistent with what was seen in Compass. On the flip side, if you don't have coronary disease, your rates of MI are about half of those with coronary disease and the benefit appears lesser. And that's because the pathobiology of these events is probably less thrombotic and more um, uh, demand related. Now, in contrast, those patients with coronary disease actually had lower risk of limb complications. So you can see on the right side of the slide, this is ALI, but those patients without coronary disease had high risk of ALI and they derived their benefit from limb outcomes. And so we see heterogeneity in risk and for the benefit of the drug, just as we would have anticipated from the prior data sets. The other subgroup I wanna comment on is one that is understudied in medical therapy trials, and that's the group of critical limb ischemia. And overall in Voyager, it was about a quarter of the population or about 1,500 patients, more than all of the other mega trials listed on this slide combined. 
And so it's a large experience. And as you'd expect, even in spite of standard of care, those patients with critical ischemia in the orange are at much higher risk than those without critical ischemia. And you can see a 10% absolute difference in risk at three years, but, but even at six months, you can see a doubling of risk. So CLI patients are the sickest and the highest risk of our patients with PAD undergoing revascularization. And here we saw consistent benefit. And actually, when you look at net clinical benefits, so the composite of the um, acute limb ischemia, major amputation, MI stroke, all cause mortality in these irreversible bleeding events. So you put them all together in a net, you see a large uh, absolute benefit and, and, and relative benefit for the CLI patients, also without CLI, number needed to treat 26, particularly better, but particularly beneficial in the CLI patients. And this has been a population for which we have had no medical therapy. So I think an important observation in this trial including the need for someone coming back for another intervention. So this is your CLI patient. You do a revascularization. What's the likelihood they're going to show up in the emergency room needing some urgent revascularization? And here you can see a clear benefit also for this outcome distinct from the primary outcome. So this, this, these data were published uh, in the New England Journal in 2020. Uh, and you can see here, Mark Krieger and Will Hyatt, well, it, um, I think it was quite appropriate that Mark uh, wrote the editorial for the trial. It was called a Bone Biagra for PAD. Um, and his longtime friend, uh, Will, Will Hyatt, was the uh, principal uh, investigator and chair of the study. But this is just the beginning. And I think one thing to note um, in terms of care for peripheral artery disease, the large gap between trials and outcomes. And this is worse in PAD than other forms of atherosclerosis. These are data uh, published in Jack recently looking at the use of statins and high intensity statins according to the type of atherosclerosis you have. None of it is particularly good, but if you look at the bottom of the slide in the gray bars, you can see that only about a third of patients in this million patient data set were with PAD were on statins and about 15% were high intensity statins, much higher for patients who have coronary disease. And so there's a major gap in implementation of trial findings, particularly in those in PAD. There are great disparities in terms of um, this type of atherosclerosis, but also overlapping with traditional disparities in healthcare availability, so socioeconomic and racial factors as well. The other thing that we, um, we understand now and, and you saw from Euclid is that the patient with PAD and diabetes is different. And there's such a large component of infection driving amputations that thinning the blood with antithrombotics and, uh, and revascularization aren't enough. And this is a, a paper published by Josh Beckman in 2019 showing that microvascular disease is both independent and synergistic with macrovascular disease in predicting amputation. And so we need to do more work to understand the pathobiology of these events. So I'll just summarize that you know, dedicated PAD trials like Voyager really enable to step forward in understanding the epidemiology of PAD, heterogeneity of risk, and the role of medical therapy. Not all PAD patients are the same, and we need to study outcomes that are relevant for this population. In spite of the steps forward in research, the provision of care remains poor, especially in populations with disparities, and this must be addressed. Um, and then I think amputation and critical limb threatening ischemia and PAD and it, with concomitant diabetes is complicated. And we need more science to understand the risk profile of these patients. Now I wanna spend just two more minutes to talk about mentorship and then we'll turn it over for questions. First, I was struck when I came from Boston to Colorado and I started rotating on the wards. There are a lot of people that I interacted with. I say, I, I, I work over at CPC and they'd say, what, what's CPC? So, I just thought I would uh, mention that you know the CPC stands for the Colorado Prevention Center. We are very much part of the family, part of the university. It's it's a nonprofit ARO with a very um, excuse me for the typo there, very uh, close relationship with the university and a formal affiliation agreement. It's founded about 30 years ago by Bob Schreier for this trial, this uh, ABCD trial, um, and it, it is led by university faculty. It's dedicated to clinical research and community health. And it's overseen by a board, including uh, the chancellor, dean, chairman of medicine, and chief of cardiology. We've got a great group of faculty. Uh, I'll just highlight them here. 
um, that are just outstanding in terms of community health and clinical research. And we have two new faculty members external that we're recruiting, um, which hopefully uh, we can report soon, but extremely experienced, uh, highly skilled people. And so there's a lot of expertise here and we wanna work with you. Um, particularly if you're a trainee, we have a, a formal fellowship. Um, you can see some of our fellows here and residents, and they've been extremely productive uh, over the last couple of years, including uh, major publications, presentations at meetings, um, really innovative research. So um, we wanna work with you and our faculty are ready to, to uh, share projects, to mentor, give advice, whatever you need. We've had a productive 2021 already. Um, and you can see on the far, uh, bottom right here, Greg Schwartz and Michael Zarek, um, who have really led the way in terms of understanding the effects of of lipid lowering therapies in multiple trials, but particularly Odyssey and the role of things like LP little A. And so we were very grateful to have um, Michael as part of our faculty and Greg as a, as a collaborator. Um, and we have a busy uh, ACC on the way, including for our fellows. So you can see Mark, Mark Svet there has a COVID-19 poster and one of our collaborators, Lavanya Kondapali, a, a cardio-oncology expert, um, presenting some data that we did together out of the uh, Compass Data Warehouse. We, um, we have a lot of things on our plate uh, in terms of different disease states, observational work, implementation science, pragmatic trials, educational programs. So there's a lot to get involved in. And we have a very active community health program. So uh, Ray Estacio and others lead this. Um, there are two big cohorts. There's the Community Heart Healthy Solutions and Charlar. These are recognized by the CDC as longstanding beneficial programs in populations at risk to improve the provision of care and to reduce cardiovascular risk factors. And there's a large behavioral health component as well. And they'd love to work with you. Um, and we're over in Bioscience 3 and we have a great new space. Um, just wear a mask, but we'd love to host you over here and, uh, and have you come visit and talk about potential projects. So I'll just say thanks to all my mentors. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be part of this uh, wonderful environment. And uh, please reach out to us for mentorship. And I wanna say, never too old to be mentored. I want to thank uh, the group on this slide. So, so David, Peter, Greg, and, and of course, Will, who, who recently passed away, who has been my mentor since coming to this uh, fantastic place. So thank you. And I'll just end with a little homage to, to Will, who passed away uh, just last fall and, and who was uh, a key mentor in bringing me here. So thank you. Mark, thank you very much. That was a terrific presentation. Um, Congratulations to you and Will on this uh, really beneficial trial um, that uh, will have an impact on our patients. Um, tell us a little bit more about the last couple of comments you made about race and ethnicity and underserved populations. Uh, what did you notice about them in your trial specifically? Well, you know, it's a great, great question. This is, um, a big problem in in uh, in medicine overall in healthcare, but but also particularly in peripheral artery disease. Uh, there's some very good work out of the Dartmouth Institute looking at patterns of care and systems of care. And what you see actually is that rates of amputation are highest in areas where there are um, uh, lower rates of revascularization and diagnosis of PAD. And these tend to alias with uh, uh, um, African-American populations and populations that have traditionally had disparities in care. And we see that in the trials as well. In fact, there are patients that are getting amputation as their first vascular intervention before they have medical therapy or they have attempts to revascularize and salvage the limb. And so this is an area that is increasingly in the forefront for peripheral artery disease and one that we, we is critical to address. So do African-Americans and... Um... Um, individuals uh, from other backgrounds, Asia and Hispanics, do they have the same response to River, River, River Boxeran? Yeah, so no, it's a great question. We, we, um, we, see, we don't see effect modification based on race um, so that we see consistency in general, but the, in, in the trials overall and in cardiovascular trials overall, I don't think that we have adequate representation um, and I think we need to do better in cardiovascular trials going forward. And this is something that we are um, looking at. Uh, we've recently submitted an SFRN for cardio-oncology, but also in our, our, pregnant, our COVID trials to make sure that we have adequate representation of different groups to make sure we know 
um, the risks and, and the benefits of these therapies. What about other agents like SGLT2I uh, or GLPRA in terms of progression of uh, peripheral vascular disease? Well, th that's a great question. So this trial is very much focused on, on antithrombotics just because I wanted to tell the story of Voyager, but, but we are really an exciting time in peripheral artery disease in that um, there are a number of therapies. I, I talked about PCSK9s and, and the role of potentially LP little a, an area where Greg Schwartz and Michael Zarek have really led the science. And then in addition, the GLP-1 agonists for diabetes have shown reductions in amputation. Um, we're doing some work there. And there's actually a dedicated trial called STRIDE, which is a functional trial in PAD, a registration trial, which we're involved in. Um, the SGLT2 show big benefits in, in PAD patients with diabetes, but for heart failure and kidney disease, um, there's been some question around amputation risk um, and, and, um, and no clear limb benefit, but, but clearly benefits for those other outcomes. So we have more and more options for this high risk population. There's, there's a lot of interest in what your child tells us about the etiology and pathogenesis of peripheral arterial disease, um, peripheral vascular disease, um, and uh, in the context of differences that uh, are seen with diabetics and non-diabetics, uh, microvascular versus uh, larger vessel disease, and uh, why uh, certain individuals are at risk for thrombotic lesions. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a great question. I think that the more, it's like all science, the more we learn, the more questions come. But I think there was a, you know, a notion for many years that atherosclerosis anywhere was all kind of the same and, and PAD patients are different. The biology is different. And, and, and you can, you know, as we showed, even in, in spite of a lot of risk factors, most of these don't have coronary disease They develop predominantly, you know, disease in the limbs. And it's even different for those with diabetes where you have more distal disease below the knee, small vessel disease. And then you have synergy between immune system dysfunction, neuropathy, you know, propensity for wound development to have these bad outcomes. And I think what's important is that not every therapy is gonna work the same for every patient. We have to study them and we need to understand these biologies so that we can uh, ultimately develop better therapies for them. We shouldn't assume the same thing that works in a coronary patient is gonna work in PAD and particularly those with diabetes. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to get uh, clinicians to uh, give up antiplatelet therapy uh, for this disease? Yeah, well, it's a great question. You know, the um, the familiar combination of aspirin and clopidogrel for for at least for cardiovascular practitioners and interventionists is it, it's hard to give up, and we use it all the time in coronary patients. And I think there has been. Um, broad utilization in patients with PAD treated endovascularly because it was the best option available. You, you know, hopefully the data will speak for itself. I think that there is really no compelling benefit for clopidogrel and PAD patients long-term. E even the Capri trial, which argued monotherapy might be better than aspirin, showed no benefit for limb outcomes and, and was a trial done almost two decades ago and, and without sort of standard background therapy now. So I I think hopefully that as data come out, practice will shift, um, but that will take time. And tell us your uh, thoughts on uh, the relationship between COVID infection and limb ischemia. Great question. We, we actually have um, Max Woolauer, who's a vascular surgeon on campus, is leading a multinational registry that we're, we're assisting with. And I think 35 countries looking at vascular outcomes in patients with PAD uh, in the setting of COVID. And we know that COVID uh, is associated with a coagulopathy, coagulopathy and a vasculopathy, and that there have been higher rates of acute limb ischemia in artery and artery embolism that have been quite severe. I think the other, not it's not a direct impact, but the other corollary of this is that a lot of patients with PAD have delayed care because they're afraid to come to the hospital. And this is actually translated into worse outcomes for some of our patients who unfortunately, had they been seen in the clinic earlier, you know, might've salvaged a toe or a limb or whatever, but, but you know, they've kind of waited it out uh, because of fear and then unfortunately had, had worse outcomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's um, an obvious relationship between peripheral vascular disease and cerebrovascular disease. Uh, 
how do these agents work in cerebrovascular disease? What do you think are the next trials uh, that are on the horizon? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's a, that's a great question. You know, there's sort of a tension between the lumpers and the splitters, right? And for, in terms of trials, and you know, they, you know, stroke patients have athero, and, and carotid patients, like PAD patients, have athero, and so they they have risk. Um, but you know, their response to therapy isn't the same as coronary patients either. In fact, um, you know, in, in a in a patient who's had a stroke, there are several trials that suggest that long term antithrombotic therapy is associated with a, a higher risk of intracranial hemorrhage, and those are from dedicated stroke trials, as well as secondary prevention trials like TRA and others. And so the risk benefit, I think, requires dedicated dedicated studies. I think that you know patients with um, particularly prior stroke should be studied in large enough numbers to understand the balance of efficacy and safety. And so I, I actually think that rather than the big lumper trials like TRA or like Fourier or others, that we should start doing much more tailored trials to high risk populations, adequate numbers, and then endpoints designed for those populations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Tell us about the checks and balances that are in place in terms of conflicts of interest. For, uh, for trials? For working, for working with pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, so, so um, certainly, um, you know, working with pharmaceutical, with pharma is a partnership. And, and I think it's, a, it's an important partnership, right? Because the resources to do trials like like Voyager, Odyssey, or Fourier, these big trials are, are just not possible without the collaboration with industry. That being said, you know, we have to be careful of biases and conflicts of interest. And so um, obviously there are um, declarations, there, there are limits to what, um, you know, people should get paid or, or the remuneration for participating in these studies. Um, there, there are careful checks and balances around that. You have to declare all of it. And then ultimately, um, obviously, even when you're uh, academically involved, sometimes the academic conflicts of interest are, are more important than the financial ones, right? I mean, if you spend your whole career believing something, you know, you're very wed to that. And that's where peer review and, and, um, and guideline bodies and others play an important role in balancing all of that. Mm -hmm. And what about the interactions that you have with statistical groups or data safety management groups um, uh, throughout the trial? Yeah, so there are no, you know, every trial is, uh, it's like a, like a village, right? It's a community that comes together to answer a question. And there, there's, there are a number of groups or investigators all over the world. Most importantly, they're the patients that entrust us with their safety uh, during trials. And then we have independent groups like data monitoring committees who, um, who have access to unblinded data uh, who are completely independent and have the authority to modify or stop a trial if they feel that people uh, uh, are at risk or there's some issue. In fact, I've been part of trials that have been to had stop, subgroup stop early for, for harm. And so we depend on, on all of these parties to, to play their role. Um, and, you know, and, and, uh, and, and there's an enormous number of people that contribute to every study. Right. Well, Mark, I wanna thank you for a really terrific presentation. Um, do you have any uh, closing remarks you'd like to make? No, I just want to say, um, you know, I think for the trainees that are listening, um, you know, the path through academic medicine, you know, there, there can be, um, you know, challenges, there can be, you know, different ideas and so on. I, I think um, it's a wonderful career and you're in an outstanding environment, but reach out to good mentors, um, explore different projects. Um, and, and it's the greatest career you could have um, if you have the right Right support. And so if there's anything I can ever do to, um, or, or we can do at CPC to support you, please reach out. Okay. Thanks again, Mark. Really appreciate your presentation. Thanks.